Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on SASE in action. Technical walkthrough. So my name is Ronald van Kleunen and I'm an SD1 sales specialist at Cisco and I will be your host for the webinar today. So presenting today we have Satit, a technical solution architect for SD1 and Hong Lei, a technical solution specialist for security at Cisco. Now a brief recap in case you missed the previous sessions. So on the 3rd of November, we had part one with Danny Smolders, the APJC manager SD1, who was covering the journey to SD1 and multi-cloud and was focusing and covering the business drivers. 17 November, we had part two, Kian Hao, Shamil and Syed, they covered Get Sassy with Cisco. So we're going into the architectural details of SD1 plus Sassy. Now, before I hand over the session, I would like to cover some basic housekeeping matters. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them through the Q&A panel found at the bottom of the right-hand corner of your screen. And our speakers will be addressing them live during the Q&A section. So at the end of the session, please take a moment to rate and provide your feedback on the presentation. If you encounter any technical or audio difficulties during the webinar, please be assured that the on-demand recording will be made available to you after today's live session. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand over the presentation. Satit, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Ronald. Uh, good morning, everybody uh, who joins the call. Uh, my name is Satit Adirek, Technical Solution Architect on the sd wan solution of Cisco. Uh, let me go to the recap uh, section a little bit on the SASE, right? The recap here, it's going to talk about the, the what exactly is a SASE. Actually, if you look at the other definition, the SASE contains of multiple technologies. On the left side, as, uh, as you can see, it is the network as a service technologies, which contains the SD-WAN and carriers or the WAN optimizations or bandwidth aggregators. And on the right side, it is more on the, uh, more on the network security as a service, which is going to cover on the cloud security, firewall as a service, and so on. So in this demo, uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, we're going to focus on both sides uh, both two sides, network and the security. And we're gonna do have uh, a demo for you. Uh, in my sections, I'm gonna do a de some demo on the network as a service, which is the SD-WAN solution from Cisco. So uh, the main purpose of the SD-WAN is we want to connect everything. Uh, no matter what you have, uh, the branch internally uh, in the data centers and the, and the branch, or you will may have uh, infrastructure as a service on the cloud. We try to connect everything, and it doesn't matter what is the, the transport that you are using, internet, MPLS, or the uh, 4G LTE, or in the future it might be the, 5, the 5G connectivity. We can do an automatic failover the link uh, to the best path that it is possible to use between sites. And also we have the uh, TCP optimizations or WAN optimizations in uh, technology in place uh, between branch, so you can speed up the the transfer rate a little bit here. And also if you if you have a link which is the internet, and the internet usually comes with the loss or it is not really uh, unreliable, it is not uh, reliable, then we can use the technique called the forward error correction to correct the loss uh, uh, between sites, between uh, the links. And, um, and uh, as, is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're not talking about the on-ground uh, locations. We also uh, connect to the cloud infrastructure as a service as well. Uh, the famous ones are the AWS or Microsoft Azure and the Google Cloud platform, right? So. That comes to the first demo that we're going to have. Uh, we're going to show you uh, how to connect the uh, infrastructure as a service to the SD-WAN fabric that you have on the ground. And in this demo, we're going to have the AWS uh, uh, integrations. And uh, look at the diagram at this time. We have four, uh, four edges device. 
uh, implemented at the branch level. And we're going to spin up two of the uh, SD-WAN routers on the cloud in the transit VPC. And then we're going to create the IPsec connections between the, uh, the SD-WAN routers to the, the transit gateway. And not only that, we're going to do the uh, dynamic routing, uh, BGP routing, uh, between the transit gateway and the SD-WAN routers. And we have two host VPCs attached to the transit gateway. Uh, this is the simple setup that usually it is uh, the best practice at this time for the AWS uh, for uh, uh, to connect it to the applications. And uh, the good thing is uh, we not only uh, we are doing everything in one shot uh, from the v managed controller of the SD WAN, right? So let's jump to the demo at this time. So as you can see here, we have four VHS or the WAN edge routers connected on the ground, and we want to onboard the uh, two of the routers, the virtual routers, to the AWS, right? And then the first, the first thing is we need to create the template, and the template of the uh, of the AWS is very easy. And uh, we have uh, uh, we're gonna have the WAN uh, connectivity, which is using the the gigabit zero slash two interface at this time. And uh, on the VPN 512, which is the our band interface, we use the gigabit one. And that's it that we need to configure on the template. Uh, after creating the template, we just have to attach the two of the VS routers or the CSR routers and put in some information like the system IP or site ID and also the host name on the template. And before you configure the device, you just uh, check the configuration uh, just to be sure that uh, everything looks good. And then after that, you just configure the, the device. So you wait for a while because uh, uh, this is only assignment on the serial number. Uh, of the uh, of the virtual routers, right? And uh, there's nothing spin up yet, so that's why it is done scheduled. It's waiting for the uh, the routers to be spin up. And you go to the multi cloud uh, option of the SD WAN. Uh, we have already configured the credentials on the AWS, right? So we just put the credentials there, and uh, in this case, I use a key uh, API key from the AWS. And then uh, go to Cloud Global Settings. Uh, this is where we configure the the, the version of the SD WAN edges and the size of the instance, and also the IP subnet on the transit VPCs that we're going to create. So there are options here that we can use, and um, we can have the uh, BGP connect uh, uh, connections. Uh, between uh, our uh, sd WAN routers to the transit gateway, right? And at this time, the AS number is 6,400 uh, for, yeah, 64,000 uh, AS number. And then uh, we, uh, we're going to attach two of the VPCs that we have the application running on. Then uh, we just select that, and then we just tag it. Uh, and at this time, we're going to tag it in uh, the ASEAN uh, uh, SASE demo, right? So uh, whenever we tag it, we're going to use it later on. So the system from the vManage is going to the AWS account and tag the, those two VPCs that we're going to attach to. Then we go back to the cloud, uh, to the cloud uh, gateway, and then we just establish the cloud gateway. Uh, this is the two routers that we're going to spin up. So uh, the region that we're going to put is the the ASEAN uh, region, and we have two of the uh, CSR routers running on. And if you want to change the size of the instance or the version of the instance, you can uh, you can click on customize, or otherwise you click on the the default. 
and it's going to create the transit DPCs and host the two of the uh, CSR routers up there, and then do the IPsec and BGP to the transit gateway. So after we have done configuring it, now it is the we manage job to to do everything. Uh, it uh, basically it just go to talk to the AWS portal to create the transit gateway, and this is the portal of the AWS. Uh, as you can see on the screen, that it is uh, the transit gateway is being created uh, without having to you know uh, having to touch anything on the portal of the AWS. It is automatically created by the vManage controllers. And let's go back to the vManage a little bit. And what uh, what it is doing is it is trying to create the VPC for the transit uh, for the transit gateway. So if you look at the VPCs right now, the cloud gateway AWS is already created with the IP address that we configured on the portal of the vManage. So everything looks fine at this time. So the next step is it's gonna create two of the CSR routers. Uh, it, basically, it is gonna spin up the EC2 instance on the uh, AWS. And let's check again whether it is doing that or not. So when we, when we see on this, uh, we see that two of the instances are being created. And we need to wait for a while uh, look at the size and the instance type. It is the same that we uh, we configure on the vManage as well. All right. So yeah. So uh, at this time we need we just need to wait, and it it seems like two of the CSR routers are created uh, already. So let's check on the AWS. It is running fine. Then we go back to the main dashboard. Of the uh, of the we manage it's if you show that the uh, initially we have four of the VHS uh, now we have six already so it is up and running then we go and attach the uh, we can see that uh, there's no VPN or VPC attached we just go to the connectivity in uh, intent management and then we uh, this is where we attach two of the VPC that we contains the host applications running. Then we just hit set. So it, it's going to attach the uh, the VPCs uh, to the transit gateway. It takes uh, several minutes to finish that. Yeah. And everything should be fine. Uh, So as you can see here, uh, on the right side, we see that uh, we have one VPN, one tag, and host, VP, uh, host VPC, we have two, because we attach two of the VPCs there. And we just need to wait for the tunnel, uh, the IPsec tunnels to the transit gateway to be created. Right now, there is none, uh, but uh, at least the two of the routers are up already. So we just check again, and we see that uh, there are some changes here. Uh, at least we have seen two of the IPsec uh, uh, connection is cre being created. Uh, although it is not successful at this time, but we just need to wait for a uh, successful uh, creation. Yep. After that, after a few minutes, then we have the uh, IPsec connectivities, both primary and the secondary uh, created already. Then let's check uh, that uh, on the cloud routers that we spin up, we have the BFD sessions, which is the tunnel, the SD-WAN tunnels being created. And that means now at this time, the branch has already established the, uh, the IPsec tunnels between branch to the infrastructure as a service. And we also can monitor it from here, from the vManage monitoring uh, dashboard. Uh, therefore, tunnels are created successfully. And we just go and check the BGP neighbor, uh, uh, neighborship uh, to, the, uh, to the transit gateway. 
and we can see that uh, there are two of the neighbor uh, established by the BGP uh, appearing, right? And the AS number is 646110, which is the one that we already configured. And when we look at the routing, it just automatically comes. Uh, it will learn by the BGP connectivity from the transit gateway. As you can see here, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, 172.31.0.0 slash 16 and 172.16.201 slash 0 dot 0 slash 24, which is the uh, subnet of the uh, VPCs that we have. So let's go and check. Yep, this is the same number. So that means uh, this IP address range has been learned from the transit gateway already via the BGP. Yeah. So everything is set up already. Uh, it, it takes about uh, 20 minutes or uh, 20 minutes to 30 minutes also, and, but everything is configured uh, from the vManage itself. You don't need to uh, become the expert of the, uh, the, the AWS to do the provisioning, right? So that is the first use case that we can easily connect to the infrastructure as a service, right? Then comes to the second demo. Uh, we are at the branch at this time. Uh, in the previous demo, we already established the tunnel to the cloud infrastructure, right? But now we are talking about the internet traffic that, that's going to come out from the branch directly. But we are not very sure that the traffic of the internet is going to be uh, very secure or, or not. You, do, you want to have some control on the internet connectivity, right? So uh, that's why you probably need to have a firewall there, but you don't want to spend time to deploy the firewall and you don't want to spend time to manage the firewall on the ground because uh, you want to uh, make it simpler. Then uh, you have uh, with Cisco SD-WAN and Cisco Umbrella uh, together, we call uh, SASE solutions. So we actually create the tunnels, the IPsec tunnels automatically to the uh, Cisco Umbrella. And it doesn't matter uh, which location are you located. Uh, we're going to find the closest data centers, the data centers that it is very close to you. Uh, in this demo, uh, um, uh, we are located in ASEAN countries. So the nearest country is going to be uh, Singapore. And uh, look at this chart. Uh, the second nearest country is going to be uh, uh, Tokyo, right? So uh, we don't need to specify the destination of the tunnels. We can uh, let the system find our find uh, the closest path and tell us. So uh, the benefit is uh, if you have the uh, location around uh, the globe, then you don't need to worry where it is going to be uh, building the tunnel to, right? Let's, uh, uh, let's the system uh, takes over that. So uh, this comes to the second demo. Uh, let me switch to my setup here. So you can see my, my vManage controllers at this time. We have uh, two uh, routers, one at the hub and uh, one at the branch, right? So we're gonna uh, we're gonna provision the uh, the uh, IPsec tunnels from the branch. So then let's go to the template and look at the the template that we already built. Um, firstly, we need to configure the credentials on the SIG. So looking at here, we can see the organization's ID, uh, which is this, 2637714. And if you log into the uh, Umbrella portal, uh, you can get this number from the Umbrella portal. So it is, ex uh, it is exactly the same number that we have here. And also the registration key and the secret keys, right? So. We just need to go to API keys and go to the uh, umbrella management. Then you just copy this and put it over here. But uh, uh, this is not the easiest way. The easiest way is you just register 
uh, the vManage controllers to the smart account, smart account credentials. Uh, whenever you put in this information, uh, the template and the credentials will be automatically learned uh, between the vManage and the umbrella portals, right? But in this case, uh, I don't have the I don't have that set up, so that's why I need to uh, put in the credentials manually. Uh, once we have that, the second thing is we want to go to the IPsec uh, seek, right? And uh, at this time, we have two IPsec connectivity uh, set up. Uh, we can specify uh, uh, the, the 11 number is uh, the primary IPsec, and the 12 is the secondary IPsec connectivity. Uh, we have set up here IPsec 11, IPsec 12. And that's it that we need to do. After that, we just go to the template of the device. And we just put the IPsec uh, connect, uh, connect, uh, configuration here, and also the, with the credentials. And that's it. So we just, uh, we just uh, provision the uh, the the SIG over here to do the automatic tunnels to the umbrella, right? So once it is done, uh, when we see that the uh, the network tunnels is being created or not, uh, we can see here that it is already created, and this is the uh, this is the name here. It is from API. So one one hundred thousand is the dummy variables, and but the number in the back is 11 and 12, right? If you don't want, uh, if you want to change the name, you don't like this number, then uh, you can actually change it to branch test, maybe branch demo, one primary, and click on save, right? Then you can click on here, Branch, branch demo two. Oh, no, branch demo one secondary, right? Yeah. So, so this is how how you name it. But uh, if you don't need to do any, uh, if you don't do anything, it's going to be uh, created by the API that we have. And look at the locations here. Uh, the primary, the primary tunnel is being created to the Singapore data centers because it's. It is very close to to ASEAN, right? Um, for the secondary, it sees that the Tokyo is the second closest data centers locations. So then it just send the uh, create the tunnels to the Tokyo uh, as a backup. So uh, you can see that the um, the tunnel creation is quite simple, and you don't need to put in a lot of parameters like uh, IPsec. Uh, version or pre-check keys or anything. It's just, uh, just a simple credentials, API keys, and then everything is, uh, everything is established. And if, if you think about it, you have a lot of branch and the branch is located somewhere else, then it just, you don't need to worry about the location where it is going to terminate the, uh, the tunnels. This is the way that we actually, uh, connect to the our security is from Cisco SD WAN solutions, right? And this is the I haven't shown this, but the, this is the diagram that we just do. Uh, we have a primary and the secondary tunnel created. Yeah. So uh, this is how we actually connect uh, using the uh, the SD WAN, which is one part of the SASE solutions, SASE platform from Cisco. Uh, the second part of the presentation will be uh, will be more focused on the umbrella features on the security side. So uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Hong Lei, who is the technical solution architect of the cloud security platform. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. One second, let me share my screen. Yep, we can see your screen now. Okay, cool. 
Hello everyone, my name is Hong Lei. I'm the technical solution architect within Cisco that handles the cloud security portfolio. So uh, within the uh, second part of the agenda today, so what I'm going to show you is really how we can easily leverage on Cisco SSE platform to protect everything that we, we have, that part of the connectivity that was built uh, by my colleague Sati just now. So this is one of the critical components uh, within SESI solution as well, because that is where we can actually uh, protect your traffic and gain all the visibility and also to respond to any other potential threat you may have in your environment. So without further ado, I'm going to just uh, give you a quick overview in terms of the uh, SESI architecture in the cloud. Right, just now we have discussed how SD-WAN can be easily used to interconnect different cloud platforms, be the private cloud or even public cloud. So the second part is really to run the scanning of the traffic in the cloud. So you can see here at the bottom, we can get the traffic using different methods. Of course, SD-WAN is one of the important way of getting the traffic easily uh, from traffic perspective. But we also have other flexibility to allow customers to get the, their traffic to be sent over to our SESI platform in the cloud. So you can use your traditional firewall routers, so that doesn't really matter. And you can also use our any kind of agent, which is one of the key areas that we focus on uh, during this pandemic time, because a lot of people are working from home. And here they still want to enforce the protection and get the visibility over there. So once the traffic is sending over to the SESI engine, what you can see here is that we have multiple layer of protections. So we believe we should not rely on a single solution over here, right? So we need to rely on multiple technology because that is what hacker is trying to leverage on as well. So number one we have here is really to run a DNS security because a lot of traffic today, we'll see 99% of traffic today you're trying to leverage on DNS protocol to reach the internet for the first connectivity. So that is where we can enforce a very broad but yet a very effective protections to to give you the uh, ability to do things like content filtering. Or we can also block the security incidents uh, like malware or also ransomware. Right. So second part of the protection here is to run the cloud deliver firewalls. Traditionally, you may need to run the firewall at every single branch. And now you have a flexibility to shift the firewall features into the cloud. So from there, we can help you to run the up to layer seven controls. So you can control by applications that can be easily managed by proxy. For example, like a Tor browser, BitTorrent, and any other of the collaboration tools. And the traffic will be actually sending over to SWG engine, which is the core of the SESI platform as well. So from there, we can run the HTTPS inspection to look at what is really going on inside the packet. Because if you look at the traffic today, I would say 80%, more than 80% traffic today is running HTTPS. So if you don't decrypt it, in fact, just get the protection, just say similar to DNS protection, right? Because you won't be able to understand what's the actual URL you, you will be using and you can't enforce the control like antivirus scan or, or sandbox integration over here. So things like DLP and the browser isolation, some of the cool features that will be coming up very soon into a SESI platform. So a customer is able to have a, a single platform to manage all the traffic they'll be sending over to the cloud, right? So things like uh, sensitive information or things like some critical data you actually want to enforce uh, the regulation when people share with external party. And browser isolation is another key area as well. For example, some customer would like to have a so-called close 100% security for all the risky websites, for example, right? So some uh, well-known websites like Cisco, Google, the the chance of being compromised is really low, but some of the category websites that customer want to run a full browser isolation. Or you can also have the option to run a browser solution of all the traffic. So that is what we are trying to provide to our customers in terms of how flexible or how secure you want to manage your data. And of course, some main uh, functionalities like decentralized reporting. 
right? You don't have to go to a separate place to manage different logs. Or you can integrate with your uh, S3 bucket uh, from AWS or any SIEM solution to do the correlation or even the uh, uh, the BI functionalities to understand, analyze the traffic that coming from this platform. So this is how uh, how we actually provide the protection at high level. So next, I'm going to show you one of the important use case here is to control the application usage within the organization. The reason is very simple, because uh, people like us using the corporate devices would like to run all kinds of application to for different purposes. For example, some personal usage, I would use uh, some application uh, that is probably not uh, clear by IT, right? Because it is not common applications or is something that is related to my uh, personal usage. And uh, we have seen that a lot of customers today would like to have a very granular, or I would say the visibility, to understand what their people are using in terms of sexy applications, so that they can have a broad overview and have a control in terms of the how this two can be uh, uh, controlled as uh, the governance. So field of functionality, why Cisco uh, is having a strong uh, proposition here. Number one is that we can identify more than 16,000 applications, right? Then we can block over 2,000 of applications, right? Using our engine because we have a very strong uh, database of understanding from not only DNS traffic, but also the web traffic itself. So second thing is the cloud malware. It's an interesting and cool feature that we can use to inspect the data at rest in customers' cloud storage. For example, a lot of customers today are using Office 365 and using OneDrive to store all their data for all their employees. But the challenge is how can you make sure that there's no malware is running inside your cloud storage? Because that is a, a good place for people to store malware and a good place for hackers to start to leverage on to compromise any of our organizations. So umbrella perspective, we can actually do a scan used uh, of our band API approach to understand what's going on in your cloud storage. Then we can do a demo in the later in the later stage. Things like tenant controls. How can you limit access uh, for corporate um, staff to use their personal, uh, for example, Office with tenant in a way that you will only allow a corporate Office with login but block personal Office with login. Right, I'm going to show you this as well. But lastly, is the L7 visibility in terms of the uh, controlling all the non-web applications. That traditionally you need to run this on your on your enterprise firewall. So next, I'm going to show you a quick demo that I'm running in my lab environment of how we can enforce different application control for different usage. Right, the demo topology is pretty simple over here. So I do have two endpoints in my lab. Number one is the one to simulate the on network. So uh, people in the office connect to a branch router that have the IPsec connectivities to umbrella data center, right? So over there we can use to enforce the policies like the cloud delivery file and also the secure web gateway. I also have another endpoint over here to simulate as the off network users, like people working from home that doesn't have any VPN connectivity back to the office by using our any connect agents. Right, so I'm going to show you quickly now. Right, so this is my demo environment. So I have Windows 10, uh, 01, and 02. So 01 is the one I having in my office. Right, so what I'm typically to do every day in the morning is that I typically go to a browser in this case, right? So go to whichever destination I want to go. So let me just uh, use the uh, internet uh, domains. So firstly, I want to go to google.com in the morning. So as a SASE uh, platform is being adopted by a lot of enterprise customers, to authenticate users has become the key, right? So that is where we can enforce a semi-authentication that can be well integrated with your on-prem AD FS servers, as well as uh, things like Azure AD or any of the identity services that's popular in the market. So you don't need to run a separate authentication or keep a different set of the uh, credentials. So I'm just going to go ahead to log in uh, to the website before uh, just go put my user credentials. So from there, I can uh, enforce the traffic 
in terms of policy based on the username. So you can see I'm going to connect with ADFS server, then get authenticated. Right, so you can see here, that is what I have now. So you can see all the traffic is being intercepted by umbrella. So you can see we're using umbrella certificate to scan all your traffic. So from there, I, we can understand the full URL and the visibility about the uh, different usage of uh, users. So next thing we're going to do is to show you quickly how we enforce non-web uh, policies. We then we'll just give a quick demo and ping. All right, so let's do a ping to Google. Right, so we can we can ping Google easily. And you can see here that we actually add very little or minimum latency to the traffic itself. So this traffic is passing through umbrella. So we can see latency is pretty low. And next thing I'm going to show you is to ping another IP address, which is, uh, you can see here we can't actually ping it because we have firewall policy to block it. I'm going to show you uh, in the policy dashboard later on. So next thing I'm going to show you is that uh, as a, as the staff working from office, sometimes I get lazy. I want to watch some movie in the office. For example, I want to watch a little bit of Netflix. And you can see this can be easily blocked by Umbrella platform. You can see this being blocked. You can customize the block page if you want. And also give you some more diagnostic info if you want to do further troubleshooting. So that is how we can do that. And you can also do a check of your IP address you've been used to serve the web. So you can see you are using an IP address coming from 146.112.x.x. So this is actually umbrella IP address instead of your WAN IP address. Right, so that is where we can use to hide some of the uh, corporate information like IP address as well. So that is for the on-prem protection. So let's move on to the second PC, which is uh, running remotely. Right, on this PC, I have installed any kind of agent with uh, umbrella module. So you can see this module can be installed without the VPN core module that can be used uh, purely as the SASC agent for the device. Right, as you can see here, the umbrella is active and uh, I don't have any VPN connectivity back to office. I can check the status, I have my DNS protection and I have my SWG protection as well. You can see these are the head and IP uh, FQDN from umbrella perspective. So you don't need, you don't need to copy anything. So you, the agent is able to look for the nearest and uh, umbrella data center. So with with that in mind, let's go to the browser again. Right. So in this case, uh, I also want to watch Netflix. Right. So we can just go to Netflix, for example. And now you can see, I actually can go to Netflix.com because we can configure flexible policies based on the identity, right? Because people are working from home, we don't want to restrict name of uh, uh, going to those uh, entertainment websites. But we at least want to have some visibility as well. So you can see it's being uh, uh, inspected by Cisco Umbrella data set, uh, uh, CSE platform. And you can have option to do not lock any traffic logs for those uh, legit uh, events. So uh, you are kind of giving the privacy to your staff. And you can only alarm if there are some security event being detected. So that is how flexible you can give to our customers. The next use case I'm going to show you is the tenant control I mentioned just now. Right, so let's do a login to my Office 365 in this case. Okay, so I have two accounts uh, being used over here. Number one is the so-called corporate account. I will list the domain already in the umbrella dashboard. So we can use that one to log in to Office 5 to see what happens. So let's use that, yes. And from here, you can see I can actually log in to my Office 5 corporate tenant. Oops, so this is resume modify, so this is not resume. For myself, right, so this uh, testing file, we're going to show you later as well. And let's look up and try to log in use another account, like personal account. So let's log in again, use my personal 
or Office 3 can because I want to actually upload some of the work related document to my personal folder so I can actually refer it uh, using my mobile phone or any other places. So let me just log in, use the correct credentials. So you will see a message here. You can't get there from here. So what does it mean? You can log into your Office 365 tenant using this corporate network. It's being blocked, right? So then it's how flexible we can have organization to maintain the governance of, of how they use, utilize the SAS applications as one of the example. So the last example I'm going to show you here is related to the cloud storage, right? So I have a link here, Google Storage. So let's go to Google Storage. So this is my personal Google Storage in this case, and I've stored some file on my Google Storage. So first thing, I want to download my file. So let me download. And yes, you can download this file correctly, and you can open it to view it, no problem. And second thing is that I want to upload some of the information to my to my Google Drive, right? So let me do that uh, by using the file upload. So let me try to upload the file called Freedom of Client Information to this uh, personal Google Drive. So let me just do that. And now you can see you can't do that. It's not allowed, it failed because connection lost. So that is where we can enforce the granular control. So you can download or view whatever you have, but you can't upload information to your cloud storage. Or same goes to, for example, WhatsApp. You can block people from sending any picture of files by allow them to chat use the text. So this is, is the, the uh, functionality we have from the endpoint perspective. So next, let's go back to the dashboard to look at the different policies, right? So this is umbrella dashboard where we use to configure all the SASE related policies. So first policy we have here is the firewall policies, right? So it's very different from traditional uh, next-gen firewall policy structure, right? Because it's pretty straightforward over here. You just need to define source, destination, and worker applications. So a lot of customers feel it pretty easy. They can do them by themselves. That they don't have to worry about the how the how the complex things. So as you can see here, there's a rule name called block applications. Then you can specify if an application you want to block, for example, BitTorrent, Tor browsers, uh, Zoom meeting, for example, some customer because they have a uh, WebEx as the official collaboration uh, tools, so they want to block the rest. And you can also add additional applications. So we have a, a huge database they are leveraging on the EVC and by engine from the uh, Cisco technology, right? So you can pick and choose which one you want to block. And next thing I'm going to show you is the, for example, block ICMP, which is the easy piece. So you can see here, I actually have a rule to block SMP that going to one to one to one to one that actually try on my on my device that, that is being blocked. So it's pretty easy to configure the policies. So next, let's take a look at the web policies. And regardless of the traffic redirection method, is it from the firewall, is it from IPC, is it from agent, doesn't really matter. You can enforce the same level of protection or policy structure. So for example, here I have the user policy for unnetwork users. So that is where how I use in the first device. So from here, you can see I enforce the policy for this particular user called Lucas, right? Not for other people. So you can you can also choose other people or other AD group if you want. And you can have a customized control, for example, tenant control we seen just now. We only want to list these two domains for the corporate offices for login, the POC laptop, uh, POC laptop net any other domain will be blocked. And you can also see the application control over here. That is where we define things like the Netflix is not allowed. Google Drive, for example, Google Drive. It's not allowed for uploads. Now you can have a different option over here. And you can have a different set of policy for your roaming users. The so rule number two is for roaming devices. 
where you have a more relaxed rules where you don't block like the Netflix and others. So that is how simple we can leverage on this to block all the uh, unsanctioned applications. So next I'm gonna show you quickly on the reporting piece. So let's go to app discovery to look at the application we've been discovered from the environment. So under app discovery, you can see that you have uh, more than 600 applications is being discovered. So a lot of time customer really get surprised when they implement Umbrella because they have discovered a lot of applications that have not been discovered before. Right, so we we'll give you categories based on the risk. Right, so you can see the color to differentiate them. And you can also look at the traffic distribution perspective. So you can have DNS traffic. You can also look at the web traffic from here. And you'll see interestingly, there's a spike on this particular date. November 22nd, they're using huge amount of traffic in this particular environment. So you just click on that to do a further investigation about what's going on. So this will help you to pivot into this specific day. And over here, we'll show whatever application is being used on this day itself. So you can just sort it by traffic volume in this case. Right, so you can see uh, a lot more details. For example, you see that YouTube is being used that can seem tricky of traffic. And people are using a TikTok, people are using M, which is my M point, and all other things over here. Right, so right now you want to understand a few things about YouTube. So let's click on the YouTube. And firstly, we're going to give you is the some information about YouTube. So the, which are the app URL, which is the traffic, what are the traffic volume in terms of web and also DNS. So it looks like people are using a lot uh, YouTube in your environment. And we'll also give you some of the information about the risk details, right? Things like uh, business risk. How risky is this application to your business? It's pretty low, right? And in terms of usage risk, it's medium. Right, because sometimes people watch YouTube and to hook up your, your bandwidth. I also tell you what kind of compliance in terms of certification YouTube has. Right, for example, certified for those ISO, uh, PCAI, and all the uh, cover uh, compliance. So this gives you a good information uh, for the auditors or, or uh, security team uh, whether allow or block these applications. And next thing you want to know is who used YouTube, right? So you just click on identities. So again, this gives you all the list of people using YouTube. So you can see number one, again, coming from Lucas, they're watching a lot of YouTube. Yeah, so from there, you can know who are the users that utilize the application and also some other identity as well. So this gives you a pretty good uh, understanding about YouTube. So you can easily control this app from here straight away. Right, again, for YouTube, you can just block access if you want. And you can also enforce different policy for different users. For example, I don't want to block people from watching YouTube, but I want to block them from uploading some of the uh, uh, videos to their YouTube uh, channels. So you can just block uploads so people can upload and YouTube uh, in this uh, space. All right, so that concludes my first demo, is to show you how we can easily, firstly, to configure the policy, regardless of identity, and secondly, to get the visibility about what's going on. Right, so number three is to uh, control in a very granular fashion about application control. So let me move back to my slide to continue. All right. So next use case I'm going to show you here is re all related to security. Right, SETI as one of the modern platform has to provide a solid protection regardless of a attack type. Right, so because people are using a lot of these SETI applications, the traffic coming from everywhere. So you need to have a very effective way to control or to manage the threat. Right, so number one, what Umbrella can give you here is to give the flexibility to choose 
uh, use DNS layer or web layer or everything combined together because a lot of customers today are using DNS layer security. That helped them to reduce up to 75% of threats already because the majority of the malware today were leveraged on the DNS security. And if you don't as if you don't turn SSL decryption on your firewall or proxy, it means it's just similar or even not that effective than DNS layer security. Right? Because you can't get a full URL, you only block at the at the SNI level or, or domain levels. But DNS can give you protection not only for web but also any potential protocols. Right? Can be SSC traffic, can be any IoT uh, traffic. They're using a proprietary port, but they still use the DNS to resolve to reach the destination. And number two is the efficacy, right? Efficacy as the top one factor for security product evaluation that uh, has been um, being adopted by a lot of customers, because security is not just a check checkbox, right? You need to understand how effective or how accurate the vendor is able to give you in terms of uh, protect, protecting from different threats. So we have a public available report for this. So you can go ahead and check how Cisco Umbrella is able to um, be ranked as number one in terms of security efficacy compared to our competitors. And lastly is the Secure X. Right, so if you're familiar with Cisco security products, we have this uh, new platform being released recently called Secure X. So from name itself, you can see it's secure every possible thing, which is X, right? So Umbrella as a one of the important factors in this is really giving customer a lot of uh, information of, about how you run a threat defense. So that will bring me to the second demo for the uh, Umbrella. So this demo is all about how we run the threat defense or how we run investigation for security related issues. So let me bring up my browser again. So this time, what we're going to do is to go to the Secure X. Let me close this Secure X dashboard. Right, Secure X dashboard. Again, this is a cloud native platform that you don't need to install any of the footprint in your on-prem environment. So you just need to leverage API to integrate with each other. And the best thing is that we it's come with the product itself, so we don't charge separately for this SecureX uh, platform. So I will show you quickly. So this is a dashboard we have that we can integrate with different Cisco products as well as the body products. So how we integrate with Umbrella is pretty simple. Just go to the module integrations. So you can see here are my integrated modules. And we can click on Umbrella. And to see how we integrate. So basically, Umbrella provides different APIs Right, we have investigate API, we have enforcement API, and also reporting API. So make it much more granular for our customers to pick and choose what kind of functionality they want to use. So you just need to get those API key from Umbrella dashboard. Then you are good to go for the integration. So you come back to dashboard again to look at Umbrella related uh, results. For example, you can see this is uh, security blocks for the past 30 days. You can see there's increased amount of the threats in your environment be discovered. So as the first thing to do in the morning, so you want to take a closer look on what is going on in terms of the other blocks. So you can just click on this, total number of blocks. So this will bring you to the umbrella dashboard. So again, you don't need to remember all the URL or credential store login. You can leverage on SecureX to log into different Cisco products. So over here, you can see you are seeing an uh, increased number of malware. And you also see a lot of cloud malware is coming uh, up and it's unresolved. So let's take a look at unresolved incident first before we jump back to the malware. We can just clear and view details. So this will bring you to our cloud malware dashboard. Right, so as I explained earlier, so this is a feature that we can scan the file out of uh, out of bed, right? So we don't need to intercept your user traffic. We just use the API to talk to Office 365 or even Dropbox from here and to scan all the files stored in your cloud drive. So you can see that the number of new threats is being discovered. 
And these are the file names. Right, so interesting, you can see resume modify over here. You can see the full details. Its owner is Honlei, right? And it's been stored under personal document. And you can also see the exposure is private. I didn't share with anyone, right? Just keep in my storage. Then these are the uh, antivirus signatures. So right now, you, what you can do, we can do a quick uh, quarantine of this file, right? So this will quarantine your files in your cloud folder. And let me show you the file being quarantined because it's going to take maybe an, another one or two minutes, right? So you can see the file is being quarantined over here. So you can investigate further as well. Firstly, you can see the quarantine link, right? And so as the Office of Administrator, you can go to this link. Oops. So let me log into OneDrive directly. So these are my OneDrive uh, folders. Okay, let me try another browser. Okay, since the file is not there. So what we can do here is really to go to your OneDrive folder to look at this particular files, right? So you can, as a administrator, you can really quarantine or do the unquarantine of these files. So it's really we understand uh, the behavior or the risk that it gives to the enterprise of looking at all the cloud malware over here. So the second thing we're going to do today is to really look at the, the threat itself, which is our primary focus. So let's go to the threat. So we're not just telling you about, hey, you have a threat, and go and look at it. We also help you to break down in terms of what kind of threat it is. So from here, you can see, you can move it like the last 30 days. So you can see different threats being discovered, like ransomware, children, or browser hijackers. So what you can do here is to, for example, click on the ransomware, for example, to investigate a little bit further. Right, so you can see there's a 36 requests that are trying to make a connectivity to a ransomware command control of domains. And it's coming for WannaCry. So interesting, let's click on that to understand a bit further. So over here, we'll give you a clear uh, explanation about what is WannaCry using layman term. Right, you can take a look. What is WannaCry? Right, it's a variant of ransomware and leverage on the SMB vulnerabilities, which is one of the favorite from hacker's perspective, and try to explore your SMB and try to encrypt and destroy your backup in order to ask for reset. Right, so this is something not new to most of us. So what we can see here is that who actually connect to this uh, command control domains. So you can see here it's coming from Bella's laptop. It also comes again from the Lucas devices. And these are the domains that the device trying to make a connectivity to. But lucky thing is that we get it blocked by umbrella protections at DNS layer. So uh, the hacker didn't have a chance to, to download encryption key in this case. So next, what we're going to do is to leverage on our SecureX ribbon, for example, for example here. Let's click on Fund Observables on this page. So this function will help you to query or understand all the searchable information from this uh, page. So as a lazy person, I really appreciate it because I don't need to do all, all the copy paste. So just choose this domain, add to a case, add a new case, right? Because when you do an investigation, you can't 100% run this continuously. Sometimes you get disrupted, sometimes you need to go for a break. So case will really help you because all the information you have um, discovered will stay over here with you, right? So you just give a name called uh, Warner Cry Investigation, right? So this is the case book and these are the domain we're trying to investigate. So when you come back after half an hour, it's still here and you can continue the investigation. So let's investigate this in the threat response uh, dashboard. So again, threat response is one of the key pillars for SecureX uh, platform. 
So it comes for free for our customer as well. So you just need to integrate with the Umbrella and other Cisco uh, products over here. So he's doing all the heavy lifting now. They're quite, quite busy asking information from external as well as internal about anything you want to know regarding this particular ransomware domain. Right, so I'll just give a few more seconds, let it finish the investigation. All right, now we have a clear understanding about this particular domain. So firstly, we have one target, which is the Bella's laptop, right in this case. And you can see the IP address, primary and the public IP address. And uh, just mouse over to this domain, you can see it's connected to a lot of malicious files, more than 100 malicious files. Right, it's also some unknown file is being connected to this domain as well. So what we want to know firstly is the when do we see this? Right, so firstly we're seeing November 8th, last thing is November 30. Right, so a tough question being answered. So next is the, how about the information from the body? Right, we know from Umbrella and Talos, it's telling us it's suspicious. So what you can do is actually asking to ask the body as well, for example, in this case, virus total. So from virus total perspective, it's also showing uh, some are malicious, right? So you can look at details, for example, these are all details about this domain. You can see other vendors also, or even the the CISA also report this domain. So you are pretty confident now that this domain is kind of religious, uh, uh, malicious. Right, so this gives you a second opinion in terms of investigation. So now let's go ahead and look at the actions we have for this domain. So first thing, we want to make sure it's been blocked. Right, so that is the top priority. So because of its red color, it's already been blocked by umbrella. But if not, you can actually block this domain from this dashboard itself. You can trigger a block domain. So this will use API key uh, to tell Umbrella, hey, please block this domain. Right, so once a blank, uh, domain is blocked, we can look at the domain view of this using the Investic Console. So what we can do is that uh, we can go to Investic Console. This, this is the page. Then we can verify the information about these domains. So number one is that it's ranking hundreds, which means to say it's a, a malicious website. We're 100% confident about that. So Umbrella give you all the indication. We'll also tell you about the global distribution in terms of the DNS traffic. So you can see the, the DNS traffic for this domain is huge. Right, so it's all the way from the 2018 or 2017. So at least it tells you you are not alone. So a lot of people that have uh, been infected on the machine that make a connecti connectivity back to this domain. And you can look at this domain uh, instead of the understanding about the event history, right? So let's click on the starting of the everything. So on 2017, May, you can just click on this to understand a little bit further. You can see this one cry, ransomware is being added since day one three years ago, has never been changed or, or removed. So that's why this domain is considered the malicious uh, constantly, right? So we have a lot of information from here. I also tell you about the A record that's been resolved to. So this is all the IP address. But sometimes the hacker share the infrastructure. For example, you can try this, open another link. Later we can take a look and also to check other information, for example, traffic distributions. When do you see, or where do you see this traffic? It's coming from other countries like US, India, Vietnam, Europe, and all the, all the European countries. So at least it shows something that is not specific to ASEAN region or specific to specific uh, countries, right? So it's not really a targeted attack. There are a lot of samples you see that have a backdoor connect to these domains. Right, so these are malicious SHA value and other information. Now take a quick look of this malicious IP address. Right, you can take a look at other domains that's being hosted on this IP address. Right, so you can see, I could share in the infrastructure. So another domain, mining.com, 
which is pretty malicious, right, related to uh, crypto mining that uses same IP address. So from here, you can keep your investigation um, going. So uh, that concludes my second demo. It's really to show you how easy we can use our platform to run not only protection, but most importantly, to run the detection and response of using the umbrella of traffic by leveraging our SecureX platform. So let me move back to my slides. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up for today's session, right, to sum it up about what I've been discussed and some of the key things we've discussed. So number one is the SESI framework. So again, SESI is not the end goal. It's not a, a, a silo solution. So it's a journey. And Cisco provide here is really integrated SESI services with the SD-WAN and Umbrella as a cloud security engine. And number two is really flexible for a customer to consume because you can have a single SKU to subscribe where you can get in the connectivity piece, but also get the security. And compared to other vendors, you need to go with different uh, uh, licensing and probably a different partnership. So you need to handle about the, the license piece. And the microservices. Right, so as a cloud native platform, SESI shouldn't be using any of a legacy uh, platform, right? Putting a DVD in the cloud doesn't mean you can provide Netflix services, right? It has to be a uh, point in the cloud. Only run the services that is necessary in order to keep your infrastructure clean and uh, effective. And epic efficacy is, is a top priority as well, as explained just now, and global presence. So that is where our customers should really evaluate the global presence from the SESI vendor, the how strong and how mature they've been running this um, so-called pop around the world. So that is the most important uh, factor as well because they will maintain the uh, good performance and also reliability for all your traffic. And lastly, is the how diversified you can support in terms of uh, type of device and the type of the protocols. All right, so let me just sum it up. So what I've discussed today is to really to leverage on SD-WAN coming from our Vitella technology to provide you with a seamless connectivity uh, overlay, right? And not only for on-prem, but also connect to different cloud providers. So you can make a single fabric for you to reach everywhere you want to go. So next thing on top of the fab fabric have, we provide a simplified uh, overlay on how we can uh, protect your traffic that's coming in uh, using the multifunction cloud services. And with these two together, we can provide you with a complete, but also very integrated SESI platform. And that is where you can start your SESI journey with. So with that, I'm just going to move on to the Q&A panel to see uh, any of the questions coming up. Uh, Ronald, do you have any questions? Yeah, let me uh, echo that. It is a sassy journey. Very well mentioned. Okay, so we'll move now um, uh, to the Q&A section. So please uh, enter your questions in the Q&A panel. Um, I think we got some questions here uh, already. Um, I think that's for you, uh, Hong Lei. So uh, how does this sassy solution handle failover? Okay, great, uh, Ronald. Thank you for the question. I think that's a very good point and uh, important factor for the set evaluation as well, right? So, so in terms of failover, we have different methods of doing that. So number one is that Cisco have this uh, protocol called Anycast. So Anycast, you can treat it as the global virtual IP address, right? So for example, for DNS, whenever you go, you just point to the same IP address we will handle all the backend load balancing of failover for you. So this gives the benefit to our customer that they we can easily fail over to any of the uh, closed, closed data center using any class uh, technology for DNS. I also introduce this any class to our IP set uh, termination as well. For example, you're going to make a IP set tunnel with Singapore data center. And when this something happens for this particular IP address, uh, behind our uh, serving these uh, services. We can similarly favor to another instance without asking you to change your head and IP address. And we can use the same IP address even 
to fly over to in inter DC, which means to say something happened to Singapore data center. Then we can use the same same IP address and fly over to Hong Kong or Tokyo uh, without changing the any configuration. Compared to some competitors, you need to really build two separate tunnels. That's a primary requirement. Right, so everything is similar, I will say, so you don't need to make configuration changes. And you just need to wait a little bit of time for the your uh, traffic to time out. Depends on how you configure and what the interval you have. Then you can actually, uh, based on the, uh, we have a BGP, leverage and BGP to run any cost spillover. So this provides a very solid global um, platform for our customers to handle any family of the potential failover for not only DNS, but also IPC as well as the web traffic. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's important from a uh, service availability uh, perspective. Um, I also saw questions about, um, um, because we focus our seminar on uh, ASEAN and questions about uh, other countries. So later we will share an email address um, uh, so we, our team can actually help you to address those uh, questions outside the ASEAN area. Um, but we got some other questions here. Um, I think this one is for Satit. Um, okay, what is the benefit each tunnel on a SIG can support? And do we have branches that require more bandwidth? So how can actually SD-WAN support these branches? Uh, thank you for the question, Ronald. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, 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 this may be uh, confirmed. Uh, please confirm to me as, uh, as well, Hole. Uh, the tunnel, the normal tunnel that we created, it supports the 250 meg uh, megabit per second uh, bandwidth. But if you want to have more bandwidth, first uh, you have the option to request Cisco to increase the bandwidth from 250 meg to 500 meg or even one gig. But um, a, a, another option is uh, if you wanted to stick on the 250 meg tunnel, uh, we can uh, we as the SD WAN uh, HS can build uh, multiple tunnels to aggregate the uh, the bandwidth together. So uh, we can add it up to uh, four tunnels maximum. So that means we're gonna support the uh, eventually it's gonna be one gig uh, uh, bandwidth. All oh, right. Um, so that can scale then. That's also important, right? Um, let me see if there's more questions here. Um, one more security-related question. Uh, so that's home lay then. Um, how is URL filtering in Umbrella different from that one of a firewall? Okay, great. I think that is a very common question a lot of customers are asking. Because it's, hey, we have URL filtering already, then where we still need uh, another layer. So, so the answer is quite simple. So if you review your UI filtering configuration one more time, a lot of customers, I will say majority of them, uh, did not turn on the SSL inspection because of the performance and also the the license reason, right? So what they have is the UI filtering based on the 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 raw web traffic. So that gives you a good uh, protection as well, but I think you might miss out a lot of the traffic that's being uh, need the SSL inspections, right? So again, just as I mentioned, if you don't turn on SSL inspection, your protection is just equal or even less effective than DNS layer protections. And if you're going to turn on SSL inspection, and uh, you can refer to the guide from different firewall vendors, so you need to be very careful to plan in terms of the uh, scalability and also the performance, right? Because uh, to run SSI, SSI inspection, you really need a lot of powers. And like given the fact a lot of traffic today is uh, using SSL and the internet pipe is increasing. So you can't just buy a firewall that can fit the SSL decryption throughput to match the internet bandwidth. They're going to be super costly for you. But again, you also want to enable it. So that is where a lot of customers are looking to shift this functionality to umbrella so we can do the, all the heavy lifting so we can do the skill up very easily right so performance should no longer be a consideration for the SSL inspection so that is the two major difference in terms of how we run a UI filtering so another uh, important thing is that 
the firewall should be more focused on inspecting the traffic itself instead of running the web related filtering because we can for example you can run the antivirus file type control terminal control so all those advanced features that uh, you shouldn't leverage on single box to do all the functionality for you all right there is a, an additional question on an umbrella only so uh, Cisco Umbrella can block or disable proxy that installed application and web browser like uh, UltraSurf, HideMe, uh, or more? Okay, that is a good question. So we do have different categories in terms of proxy blocking. So we can block at DNS level, right? But proxy is not something easy to block, I would say, right? Because they will use some the random port or some random or IP address or even bypass the DNS security. So I would say a combination of uh, DNS protection as well as the um, uh, firewall and also web proxy will give you a, a comprehensive blocking in terms of the private proxy usage in your environment. All right. Um, well, the questions are coming in. Um, not sure if this uh, for for Satit. I uh, hope you can help with this. Um, I think it's a question for me as well. So, what? Uh, sorry, would the SD1 applicable to IoT, Internet of Things devices, uh, uh, which are not able to install certificates or proxies? Um, this question, um, it is not very clear at this moment to me. Uh, but uh, it is like uh, for the IoT devices, right? Uh, yeah, to install a certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, it is it is a very small device that uh, consume uh, very less power, uh, right? Because of that is uh, that's the purpose of the IoT. It is a lightweight uh, thing. So, yeah, it is uh, the OS of the IoT device normally doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the capability to run the SCWAN. Uh, uh, the the virtual uh, the virtual platform of the SD WAN uh, uh, edge, so that is uh, not supported. Um, I am thinking of uh, you know uh, we have the router that that supports the IoT device. Uh, that means uh, the communication is it is not the IP to IP anymore. Uh, we have a version of the router that talks uh, on the uh, for example, MQTT protocol that uh, can talk to the IoT device, and we we change it to the IP packet and then send it over to the uh, WAN or the the, uh, the data centers, or or even to the cloud. But uh, we need to have a routers that uh, supports the uh, the IoT protocol as well uh, in order to establish the SC WAN tunnels. Um, yeah, for uh, to answer the the question is. The IoT device, uh, it is just a very small device that uh, has a lot of sensors. So normally, I don't see, uh, uh, I don't see that we're gonna have a software built in into the IoT device and um, connect to the SD-WAN fabric at this time. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. of memory and CPU limitations, uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think just to add a little bit on IoT device, so. In case the IoT is using the typical uh, IP or using typical TCP IP communication, and that is where I understand, uh, yes, I agree that we can't install certificate and the proxy may break the integrity of the traffic as well. So that is where the DNS protection plays a very important and effective role in this space, right? Because now the vendor here is able to decrypt the traffic because of the pattern traffic. But we are able to understand what type of domain you're trying to resolve to. So from there, we can provide uh, DNS layer security uh, for IoT devices. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is a very important uh, thing. And also from the SD WAN perspective, you know, if, if you have a router that supports the SD WAN and you want to have the IoT uh, devices connected to uh, the network, right? Uh, we can do the segmentation as well. Just you know, totally separate the routing table. That is, uh, you know, uh, you have the IoT, uh, you have IoT device at the branch, and you have uh, maybe you have a PC or 
the video conference uh, endpoints there. You don't want it to talk to each other. Yeah, then uh, we can do the segmentations from the branch all the way to the headquarter or the AWS or Azure. It is low, like a totally separated uh, infrastructures. Yeah, we can uh, also support that uh, as well. And uh, as Hong Lei said, uh, with the uh, umbrella or you know SD WAN and uh, um, uh, uh, the umbrella C, right? Then uh, we can leverage the DNS uh, uh, traffic filtering uh, features on the umbrella side to protect the IoT device as well. Okay, uh, so I almost would say it is raining umbrella questions. <laughs> Yeah, only... I think I have another yeah. one so just now, so let me just yeah. confirm that some websites right. use one listing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just agree because of the how on-prem uh, infrastructure or platform is being architect for the past decades. A lot of uh, applications today is still using one listing about the IP address. So to address that, we're going to come up with a feature for Umbrella is that the, you first need to use a fixed exit IP address. Or you can even bring your own, own IP address uh, to umbrella infrastructure. So that is in our roadmap. But I will see we should also uh, change the mindset that uh, using the wireless IP address because that uh, is no longer that much effective, given the fact that a lot of traffic today is really distributed. So we need to uh, gradually uh, move from that uh, wireless thing as well. So we provide this facility. Uh, I think should be next year to give you the so-called transition to move away from the IP address whitelisting. So in the future, we recommend customer do not really whitelist the, the source IP address. So that is a recommendation we have. Right. There's one more question here. Uh, Cisco Umbrella, is it hardware or just a software application? And, and then uh, also the pricing. And the pricing, we can work separately on that one. Okay, cool. So Umbrella itself is 100% uh, software and it's a cloud-based, right? So you don't need to install anything in your environment. So what we can do, we can integrate with your hardware you have. Like most of them use the uh, uh, SD-WAN and some use their own firewall or router. So we can integrate and build a tunnel and we can install software agent on your devices as well. So in short, it's a software application and it's, uh, it's cloud-based. Okay, I have one more last question. Um, I think this is for Satit. Um, is it possible for Cisco to integrate infrastructure as a service manually? Yeah, uh, that is uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, yes, uh, of course we can uh, support the manual configuration on the AWS Azure or uh, GCP. But you know, uh, based on uh, my experience, it takes a long time to uh, firstly need to take cost of the right? and then uh, you need to take cost of the uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Azure in order to understand their infrastructure. And it takes time for you to trial and errors uh, for the like the uh, practice configuration. But uh, with the SD-WAN uh, demo uh, on the first sections, is it's going to do everything automatic uh, for you. But uh, And it is uh, built into the best practice fashion as well. But uh, definitely, yes, if you want to do it manually by yourself to understand more or it has more flexibility, yeah, you, you can definitely do that. All right. Thank you. So we're now on the top of the hour. Uh, but before we end off, uh, we would like to share with you some helpful links and resources that you see here on this, uh, on this slide, right? So we have here um, a link to Cisco SASE introduction. You will get it in the handouts. Uh, this is the email address I was talking about, ask Cisco sd one apjc at cisco.com. So if you have additional questions, uh, please reach out to, to us via that email address. Um, you find the QR codes, you can go to a Cisco Umbrella Studio demo, sign up for it, please. And there's a free ebook, Sassy for Dummies, a really good book to learn more in depth from what it is all about. Um, so thank you, Satit and Hong Lei, for sharing SD1 plus SASE in action with us today. It was really uh, interesting. So thank, uh, thank you to our audience for your time and participation. And as a reminder, a survey will pop up once the session ends. 
So please click continue on the pop-up warning in order to start a survey or simply click the link in the chat panel now. Okay, so your input is very important to us. So we look forward to seeing you in the future webinars and until then, stay safe.